Thank you so much. Um, it's, you know, I really appreciate the invitation, and I'm really excited to uh, tell you today about some of the work that me uh, and my many collaborators have been doing in the last few years to try and understand misinformation. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging uh, many of those collaborators. There's more. They don't all fit on the screen, but you know, all the people that worked with us, and then also all of the organizations that gave us money. And from a conflict of interest perspective, I just want to say we do get research funding from Facebook and Google. Um, so. Uh, you know, unfortunately, misinformation is a topic that doesn't need a huge amount of introduction these days. Um, obviously, falsehoods have been around for as long as communication has been around, uh, but there's a certain flavor of misinformation um, that has gotten a lot of attention, starting with the 2016 election cycle in the U.S. and Brexit in the U.K., where they've entirely fabricated statements, presented as if they were false, getting large amounts of traction, particularly online. <clears throat> concern redoubled during the COVID pandemic when there was an infodemic of false uh, and misleading claims uh, spreading as the pandemic was spreading and continues uh, to spread. Um, <clears throat> the 2020 election in the U.S. saw another round of misinformation of a different flavor, largely focused on election fraud. Um, and all of this has kicked off uh, a lot of research in psychology, cognitive science, political science, uh, trying to understand, and I guess in, in CS and, and HCI, trying to understand uh, <clears throat> who falls for misinformation and what to do about it and how to combat it. And uh, we have a paper um, last year that sort of synthesizes a lot of this research. Uh, just some quick takeaways from this in terms of why people believe misinformation. If things are repeated, people believe it more. If things align with people's pre-existing beliefs, they believe it more. If it comes from a source that you trust or the source of authority, you believe it more. And people that uh, engage in less reasoning and less critical thinking are specifically more likely to believe false claims. And also a lack of digital literacy and media literacy is associated with specifically believing false claims. So there's this big body of work uh, that has been uh, amassed. but. <clears throat> the work has almost entirely focused on the U.S., with an occasional study from Western Europe uh, popping up in there. And you know, there's, uh, there's, there's the, the volume of work focused on the U.S. has vastly exceeded pretty much everywhere else. But misinformation is not a problem that is confined to the U.S. Um, there's lots of examples of really high stakes. Uh, false claims all around the world. If you talk to people at, comp at tech companies that work on misinformation, they'll often say that they're actually much less worried about misinformation in the US than they are in lots of other parts of the world. And so <clears throat> the study that I'm going to tell you about today uh, tries to take a global view of the misinformation problem, uh, and in doing that kind of looks at many different things that we've looked at previously in the context of the US uh, around the world. So. Uh, we ran this study with over 34,000 participants recruited from 16 different countries on all six continents. Um, and within each co uh, country, we sampled uh, social media users, although that includes WhatsApp users, which is essentially everyone everywhere outside of the US. Um, <clears throat> and there was a uh, sample to be representative on age uh, distribution and gender distribution within each country. Um, not truly representative samples, but at least you know, it's in the direction of, of being representative. Um, and what we did is each subject uh, in this online study was shown a set of 20 statements about COVID-19, half of them true and half of them false. And uh, these, sample, these statements were sampled from a larger set of uh, 30 false and 15 true, just presented as statements without information, uh, image or source information. And then they're randomized into one of four conditions that I'll tell you about in a minute. But the thing about COVID is that it gives an opportunity for doing cross-cultural research on misinformation that otherwise is really hard. Because if you're studying politics and political misinformation, <clears throat> the politics of every country is different. Every country will have its own set of headlines and statements that are relevant. And so if you see differences across countries, you don't know whether that's because of actual cross-cultural differences or just some idiosyncrasies of which headlines or statements you are using. Um, but because COVID is this truly global phenomena, we're able to come up with a set of headlines where the same headlines are relevant everywhere in the world. And to give you a flavor of what these kinds of headlines are, here's a sample of the fal of false headlines. You've got things that, like, claiming that things that work, uh, actually work, are ineffective, claiming that things are ineffective, actually work, um, questioning the severity uh, of COVID, um, and also sort of raising questions about vaccines. 
Uh, and these were all taken from either fact-checking websites that said they were false or uh, you know, WHO type lists of uh, COVID myths uh, and things like that. And then we also just had a set of true headlines that were from a variety of sources. So the people, you know, rate uh, set these headlines, and then we're going to use this to try to answer uh, a couple of questions. Um, and so the first question that we want to know is who falls for misinformation? What are the characteristics uh, of an individual that make them more or less predisposed to believe false claims? Like I said, this is something we've studied a lot in the U.S. Um, and so in order to get insight into this, we use the accuracy condition. So a quarter of our 34,000 people, uh, when they did the survey, they saw this, where they were shown each statement, and they were asked, to the best of your knowledge, is the above headline accurate? And this underline is, uh, was for your emphasis. It was not actually shown to them. And then they just rate this on the six-point scale of how accurate they think each headline is. And so given this, we can assess for each person how good they are at telling true from false headlines. Um, and I'm going to start by just showing you country-level descriptives. Um, so this is the average accuracy rating where zero is saying it's totally inaccurate and one would be saying it's totally accurate um, for the headlines that are true in blue and false in red across all our 16 countries. I'm going to start with the U.S. So here you can see that about 60% of the, head, the true headlines were believed and about eh, 25 or 30% of the false headlines were believed. This lines up pretty well with what we've seen in countless experiments that we've run. People do believe the true headlines more than the false headlines, but they're also believing a lot of the false headlines and failing to believe a lot of the true headlines. And so then you know, our first order question is just how general is this or how much does this vary across conditions, uh, sorry, across countries? And what we find is there's actually remarkably little variation across countries in the belief in the true headlines, while there is substantial variation across countries in the belief in false headlines. Our study was not really focused on the cross-cultural differences. We're trying to look for cross-cultural regularities in what features of individuals uh, predict susceptibility. But obviously, you know, we have this big cross-cultural data set, so I'll just briefly note that some country-level factors that correlate with uh, belief in the false claims are um, so a low democracy index, so lack of access to political rights and civil liberties, countries that are like have less of that access, more likely to believe false claims. Uh, countries where people were more accepting of unequal divisions of power uh, were more likely to believe false claims. And countries that were more collectivist uh, were more likely to believe false claims. And so this sort of digging into the cross-cultural aspect of it is something that we are going to do in future work. But what I'm going to focus on now is this more individual uh, question, which is within each country, what are the differences across individuals that predict who is susceptible to misinformation? And uh, there's a few different uh, perspectives on this question that have been proposed before and that we're able to sort of look at in this, in this big sample. So the cognitive perspective, which is the thing that me and my uh, co-author Gord Pennycook have really done a lot of work on, has uh, shown that when people rely on, inf on their intuition, they don't stop and think critically, they're more likely to fall for false claims. This is true for COVID, and this is also true for political headlines, regardless of whether they align with people's politics or not. Um, and so you know, to assess this, uh, we gave people a set of math problems with intuitively compelling but wrong answers, like you're running a race and you pass the person in second place. What place are you in? You might think first place, but if you stop and think for one second, you'd be like, oh no, if you pass the person in second place, then you're in second place. So you can use these as a measure of, in general, how much people tend to stop and think versus just going with their first response. And we also just ask them, essentially, how much they like thinking, and we have some basic attention checks. And then we run um, a series of uh, regression models where, for every uh, headline rating, we predict how accurate people thought the rating was based on whether it was actually true or not, and based on <clears throat> you know, how well they did on this cognitive reflection test or how, basically their uh, score for each of these different individual differences. And then we look at the interaction between those two things. And so that tells you how much does your score on one of these measures change how sensitive you are to the actual truth of the headline when you're trying to judge its accuracy. And then everything that I'm going to show you includes controls for age, gender, whether they have a college degree or not, and their perceived relative socioeconomic status. So I'm going to show you a bunch of these results. And the general format is there's going to be one row for each individual difference measure. <clears throat> and 
I'm going to show you the coefficient that I'm going to show you is this, like, uh, how related it is to people's ability to tell truth uh, from falsehood. So positive values means people that are higher on this are better at telling truth from false. Lower means they're worse. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here, this is the, the preference for thinking, how well they do on the thinking test, and how many of the tentativeness questions they get right. And each little dot is an estimate from one of the 16 countries. And then the big dot with the confidence interval is a meta-analytic estimate across all 16 countries. And so what you can see is, in every single country, and very strongly meta-analytically, people that engage in more thinking are better at telling truth from falsehood, and in particular are less likely to believe false claims. This is all controlling for education. And if you look at education on its own, it's actually much <clears throat> more weakly associated uh, with, with belief in false claims. And this echoes results that we've gotten in the US where we actually experimentally manipulate how much people pay attention, uh, like engage in critical thinking. If you distract them <clears throat> or if you get them to feel emotional, uh, that makes them more likely to believe false claims regardless of whether it aligns with their politics. Um, so this seems like strong cross-cultural support for the idea that cognitive sophistication matters and when people don't think carefully, they're more susceptible to false claims. And there's also a social perspective, which focuses on motivation. There's lots of different kind of motivations that could lead you to believe false claims. But if you're really motivated to have accurate beliefs, then you should indeed have more accurate beliefs. And we measure this with a couple of questions about whether people should rely on evidence or just listen to political elites. And when you share things online, how important is it to you that it's accurate? And then we also looked at a different kind of social explanation involving trust which is maybe the people that believe false claims are just more gullible in general. So we just ask how much they generally trust people. And what we found is uh, how important people thought it was to share accurate information and to listen to evidence over uh, political, like party cues were both also strong predictors where people that care more about accuracy are less likely to believe the false claims, whereas trust didn't really do anything uh, on its own. And then a third perspective that has gotten a lot of attention is a, an ideological perspective. There's a lot of evidence from the US that at least in the current uh, socio-political media environment, conservatives are more susceptible, more likely to believe false claims uh, than liberals. And so we wanted to know, does this generalize? Um, and I didn't see any particular reason to expect that it would generalize. So we wanted to test that. And then we also wanted to see what about other dimensions of ideology, like, um, and so to measure conservatism, we use this classic question about should government take res responsible for individuals or should people take responsibility for themselves? And then we also asked how important people think democracy is, how much they favor equality versus greater incentives, uh, how much they you know, think there's like moral relativism versus their absolute moral rules, and also how much they believe in God or gods. And what we found was, first of all, thinking that people who think that democracy is important are much less likely to believe false claims. Um, and that was true everywhere. And to our surprise, we also found that in most countries, people that were more conservative, that more thought individuals should be responsible for themselves, were more likely to believe the false claims. So it wasn't just the US, but we found a general association between this kind of conservatism and belief in false claims. We also found that people that believe in God were more likely to believe the false COVID claims in most but not all countries, and then found a lot of variation and so no consistent pattern on the other two ideological measures. We also looked at a bunch of demographics that I won't uh, really get into, but for completeness, I'll show you. And finally, we found that pretty much everywhere, people that believed the false COVID claims more were less inclined to get vaccinated. So this, you know, hints at some kind of, it's obviously not causal, but it suggests that COVID misinformation may be, uh, you know, driving people to not believe, uh, to not want to get vaccinated. Okay, so just to, to summarize, there's support for all of these different perspectives. Uh, what being protected against uh, believing false claims comes from being cognitively sophisticated, being motivated to care about accuracy, and certain ideological factors like being liberal, democratic, and atheist. Um, so uh, this gives you a sort of um, a, a catalog of things that make individuals susceptible to believing misinformation. But one of the things that is really interesting about this kind of uh, modern form of misinformation and fake news is that often it spreads online. So in addition to belief, there's also the question of why do people share misinformation? Um, and 
uh, you know, so to, to get some insight into this, uh, another quarter of our subjects were randomized into the sharing condition, where for each item, instead of being asked to judge its accuracy, they were asked, if you were to see it online, how likely would you be to share it? Um, and you know, when we first started working on this, I just assumed that sharing was like a behavioral measure of how much you believed something. So it was a way you know, that, that belief and sharing would be the same thing. Um, but we've subsequently kind of run studies that suggest that that may not be the case. Um, and so just to give you a flavor of this, what I'm going to show you now is, uh, so this is just, I'm going to start just with the US. This is the data that I showed you earlier about the, how much people believed the true versus false claims. And now I'm going to show you the same plot for how much people in the US said that they would be inclined to share uh, true and false claims. And what you see is this strikingly different pattern where they're less likely to share the true claims and maybe more importantly, they're more likely to share the false claims. Um, and so, so you know, there's some disconnect between accuracy and sharing and sharing isn't simply showing what you believe uh, or don't believe. Um, and this is not just uh, true in the US. What I'm showing you here, the purple dot or the purple square is the difference in like how much more people believed the true headlines compared to the false headlines. So it's like the difference between the blue and red bars for each country. Um, and this is what I showed you before of the accuracy judgments. This is just another way of viewing that data. So like in the US, they uh, sorry, in the UK, they believed the true headlines much more than the false headlines. In India, they only believed the true headlines a bit more than the false headlines. And now you can say, what about the same thing where instead of accuracy judgments, you're looking at sharing intentions. And so in gold, you see how much more likely they were to share the true headlines compared to the false headlines. And what you see is in every country, sharing was less discerning uh, than accuracy. Um, although the extent of that disconnect varies across countries and places like the UK, there was a huge disconnect in some other places like Italy or India, there was less of a disconnect. Um, but in general, there's a disconnect between accuracy and sharing. And so the natural question is like, what's going on? Like, why are people less discerning when they're deciding what to share than when they're thinking about what's accurate? And so one explanation is people purposely share false claims to promote some kind of agenda. Um, I think that happens occasionally, but not that often. Another uh, explanation is people are sharing these things to debunk them or to make fun of them. But we've looked at that and that actually, actually happens quite rarely in a set of like 2,000 shares of false things, of false claims that was only maybe like 4% of cases where people are sharing it to debunk it. Um, and so what we think is a driver of a lot of this disconnect between accuracy and sharing is that people simply aren't paying attention because they're distracted by the social media context. When you're actually online and you're scrolling, you know, the news uh, is mixed in with baby pictures and cat videos and all kinds of other stuff that is emotionally evocative content where accuracy is not relevant. So it doesn't exactly put you in a reflective mindset, plus you're scrolling quickly and you're trying to relax and unwind and all that. And the social media uh, context provides quantified immediate social feedback where you can see how many people liked things, how many people shared things, and that focuses you on these social factors. And so our argument is all of that causes you to forget to even think about whether it's accurate or not before you share it. And so if this is true, then getting people to consider accuracy, just not, not giving them information, not telling them what's true or not, or giving them warning labels or whatever, but just prompting the concept of accuracy to come to mind to people, priming accuracy, um, should make them more discerning in what they decide to share. And so uh, to test that, we had uh, the third uh, chunk of people was randomized into the prompt condition. And so in the prompt condition, first, uh, you know, when they, when they, before they know anything about what the main study is about, they're like, you know, please help us test the headline. We're interested in whether people think it's ac accurate or not. We just need you to give your opinion about the accuracy of a headline. Then you go to the, the primary task. Then we show them one headline not related to COVID or politics, just weird, just kind of like banal everyday uh, headlines, have them rate the accuracy. And then after the, they do that, they go on to complete the sharing task, the same as the people in the sharing condition. But the idea is because of by rating the accuracy of this one headline at the beginning, they'll be more likely to just have accuracy on the mind. <clears throat> and so be more likely to, to ask themselves how accurate is this other content when they subsequently see it. 
We've run a ton of these experiments in the US. We had a paper in Nature Communications earlier this year where we uh, meta-analyzed 20 experiments and over 26,000 participants that we'd run. And we consistently find that this sort of prompting people to think about accuracy um, before they engage in sharing in, makes them less likely to share false claims. It works for both political headlines that are aligned with your politics and ones that aren't. It works for COVID headlines. It works for conservatives and liberals. It works for a wide array of different headlines and different ways of prompting people to think about accuracy. And the treatment lasts at least for the duration of the experimental session. <clears throat> so we wanted to know, do these results we found in the US generalize more broadly? And uh, so what I'm going to show you here is for each country, um, the effect of prompting people to think about accuracy on how discerning their sharing is. So like the effect of prompting them to think about accuracy on the difference in their share probabilities for true headlines relative to false headlines. And uh, what you can see, so you've got a bar for each country, and then this is the meta-analytic estimate uh, across all 16 countries. And so you can see on average, the accuracy prompt is increasing uh, the quality of what people are sharing by about you know, a little under 20%. Um, so it works in general. It's not only in the US. Um, but there is substantial variation in countries uh, in terms of how well it works. And so we want to try and understand this variation across countries. Uh, and it's actually pretty straightforward to explain it. Um, so remember this plot that I showed you earlier, where this was showing you in purple, it's how good they are at telling true from false when they're judging accuracy. And in gold, you have how much more likely they are to share true uh, relative to false headlines. And so if the idea is this accuracy prompt kind of closes this gap by when they're in the sharing, when they're thinking about sharing, it makes them think about accuracy. And so it moves the gold circles closer to the purple squares by just getting accuracy on people's minds. That, that should only help in so much as there is actually a big disconnect between accuracy and sharing in the first place. Like for the UK, it should help a lot because there's a lot of room to move the gold up. But for countries like you know, Brazil or Italy or India, there's not that much of a disconnect. And so there's just not that much room for the accuracy prompt to help. And so consistent with this, what I'm showing you here is one dot per country where this is how much the accuracy prompt improved the quality of sharing. And this is how much of a disconnect there was between accuracy and sharing in the first place. And you can see that like very strongly uh, organizes these data. And so it also provides evidence that what's going on here is really pr it's prompting people to think about accuracy. Another way of getting insight into that is looking at variation across headlines rather than across countries. So now we've got our 30 false and 15 true headlines. And for each headline, we can say, how much did getting people to think about accuracy reduce the sharing of that headline? And then we can look at that as a function of how accurate people thought the headline was in the accuracy condition. Um, and what you see is this very strong relationship where the more inaccurate the headline is, the more getting people to think about accuracy reduces sharing of that headline. So if it's a headline that seems crazy, getting people to think about accuracy is going to make them share it less. If it's a headline that seems totally plausible, then getting people to think about accuracy is not going to help. Um, and so this sort of gives you some insight into where this kind of approach uh, could be effective. If there are falsehoods that have been widely uh, adopted already, so for example, uh, claims about election fraud are now widely believed by a lot of conservatives in the US. So for that, you wouldn't expect this to help because people think it's accurate. But for claims that are new or haven't yet gotten entrenched, and so therefore people think are kind of, uh, if they stopped and thought about it, would realize they were unbelievable, uh, this should help. Uh, and then the final thing in the paper is uh, the last quarter of people were randomized into a digital literacy tips condition. So at the beginning of the study, they saw these sort of minimal digital literacy tips, and then they went on to indicate their sharing intentions for the 20 headlines. Um, I don't think these tips really teach people much that they didn't already know or that's super useful here, but it's just another way of getting them to think about accuracy and sort of priming the concept of accuracy. And again, we find that this works uh, pretty consistently across countries, about half as well as the accuracy prompt, um, but still works. Incidentally, if you ask people how effective they think the different treatments uh, were afterwards, people th think that the TIPS condition was way more effective than the accuracy condition, even though actually it's the other way around. So just basic point is you shouldn't ask people how effective they think the treatments were on them. You need to really, <laughs> you need to really do the experiments. Um, 
OK, so this is a bunch of uh, evidence from these survey experiments in, uh, from around the world that getting people to think about accuracy can improve the quality of what they share. But uh, you know, a limitation of everything that I've showed you so far is we don't, we're not looking at actual sharing. We're just using the sort of hypothetical sharing measure. Um, and so we also wanted to see how this works in real life. So we ran a field experiment on Twitter. We created a set of um, uh, Twitter bots that were explicitly identified themselves as bots and were non-political. Um, we used these to follow over 136,000 users that had shared links to misinformation or fake news sites, uh, particularly focused on Breitbart and Infowars. Um, of those people, about 11,000 of them followed our accounts back. Um, which means we could send them private messages. We went through this list and we screened out about 6,000 accounts that seems like they were either bots themselves uh, or had not been sharing any news recently. And so we ended up with about a little over 5,000 users for the subjects in this field experiment. Again, they didn't know they were in an experiment, right? So what we did is they were now following our account and we sent them a, a private message that said, you know, thanks for following me. Can I ask you a favor? I'm wondering how accurate this headline is, and I'm doing a survey to find out. So it's just basically delivering exactly the accuracy prompt treatment that we did in the survey experiments. Um, almost nobody responded, like fewer than 10%. But that's fine. We don't need them to respond. All we need them to do is read that top sentence, and they've been treated in the sense that the concept of accuracy has been activated in their minds. And then what we want to know is when they close out of this and go back to their feed, are they more likely to think to themselves, well, how accurate is this next thing? How accurate is this next thing? And therefore, do we see an increase in the quality of what they share afterwards? And indeed, that's what we find. We find a significant increase in the quality of the news sources that they share links to, as judged by fact checkers. Um, and as one way to visualize this, I'm going to show you this plot that has one dot per news outlet. The size of the dot uh, indicates um, the pre-treatment sharing frequency. So you can see the users in our experiment were mostly sharing Fox News and Breitbart pre-treatment. Um, on the x-axis, you have the quality or the trustworthiness of the news site as rated by professional fact checkers. And on the y-axis, you have the change in the fraction of tweets that the users were making to each site after receiving the message. And I should say, in order to do good causal inference, we do a stepped wedge design where people get, everybody gets the message, but you randomize who gets the message on which day. So it's like each day is its own mini experiment where you can compare the people that got the message on that day to all the people that haven't gotten the message yet. So we're doing good, valid causal inference here. Um, and the key point here is there's this strong positive relationship between uh, the trustworthiness of the news outlet and the change caused by getting our message in their sharing of it. And maybe most notable is even though we recruited these people specifically because they often shared Breitbart, you get a substantial decrease in the fraction of their tweets uh, that are linking out to Breitbart. And so the implication is that platforms could do things like, here, I'm going to show it in feed. Uh, you could, I mean, as a, here, I'm going to show it as a pop-up. You could also do it in feed, where while you're scrolling through your feed every once in a while, it's like, hey, help us inform our algorithms. You know, here's some random headline. Do you think it's accurate or not? And the, the idea is, even if they threw away the responses, just asking the question would increase the quality of the news people share by getting them to stop and think for themselves of like, oh, what else is accurate, sort of refocusing their attention on the concept of accuracy. Um, and so you know, we've published uh, lots of papers on it at this point. These were the first couple. But because our really sort of mission driven in this, we also are trying to work with tech companies a lot to uh, get these ideas tested in practice. Um, so TikTok uh, read about some of our stuff on COVID misinformation. They thought it was cool. They ran uh, an RCT, and they concluded that it was effective, and they built it into their standard pipeline. We've been working with people at Google's Jigsaw group for a couple of years on building these ideas out into tools that platforms could use. We've also been in discussions, like NDA discussions, with other large tech companies uh, about testing this kind of stuff. Um, it's also something that uh, you don't need the tech companies necessarily to do. Like during the 2020 election, we partnered with a, um, a nonprofit that paid an advertiser to make a set of ads based on our research like this. And then they paid to put those uh, ads on disinformation sites. And then they found that the ads got way more engagement than usual political persuasive type ads. 
Um, and during the Georgia runoffs in 2022, they spent millions of dollars on this and got like 64 million impressions in four weeks or something for these ads. It wasn't an experiment, so we can't assess what the impact was, but we did survey experiments using the ads and found that it reduced the sharing of, of false claims. So hopefully this helped uh, you know, reduce engagement with those sites. Um, and so, you know, I think that this is a, a promising approach uh, that's a sort of UX approach to think about um, how to get people to pay attention to accuracy, which is a thing that matters, and it's a thing that people actually want to pay attention to, right? That's one of the things that's cool here is it's not like nudging people into doing something they didn't want to do. If you ask people, which we did in a bunch of these surveys, the vast majority of people say uh, they don't want to share false claims. Um, but that in that social media context prevents them from doing so just because they're distracted. And we know that tech companies are good at getting people to pay attention to things that they want them to pay attention to, namely ads. That's the whole business model. And so the idea is they can use some of the muscle that they've developed for getting people to pay attention to ads to instead uh, get them to pay attention to accuracy. Okay, so that's the, that's the accuracy prompt idea. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk uh, about before we go to the Q&A um, is this question of, okay, so I said that, uh, you know, if, if the platform did this thing where it popped up and surveyed people and said, how accurate do you think this headline is, they could just throw away the answers and it would be useful to ask the question because it puts people in an accuracy mindset. But then we also wanted to know, should they actually throw away the answers or might the answers be useful? Um, because you know, the way that tech companies are mostly dealing with uh, misinformation now is you know, training misinformation classifiers, so just using machine learning, and then partnering with professional fact checkers like PolitiFact and Snopes and organizations like that. And if you know, a, a fact checking organization or maybe two fact checking organizations say that something's false, then they'll massively downrank it and they'll put a warning on it. And I think the professional fact checking is great. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that if you see a warning on it that says a fact checker said it's false, you're less likely to believe it and share it. Even people who say they don't trust fact checkers and don't want to see the fact checks, if you show them the fact checks anyways, it reduces belief and it reduces sharing. So I think fact checking and warning labels are great. The problem is one of scale, which is that there's just a massive amount of content that's posted online every day. And there's just no way that professional fact checkers can keep up. So the question is, how can you identify misinformation in a scalable way? And what we uh, did in the final sort of uh, relevant project here is we asked how, to what extent could the wisdom of crowds be used to help identify uh, misinformation at scale? Obviously, there are you know, billions of social media users uh, compared to the handful of fact checkers, and so if, uh, Use, if like crowd identification could work, um, that is if the crowd could actually identify inaccurate claims, that could really help with doing things at a scalable, in a scalable way. Um, and you know, there's reason to believe that the crowd wouldn't do a good job because why would you trust random people to be able to tell what's true or not? But that's the beauty of the wisdom of crowds. There's like 100 years of evidence showing that if you aggregate the judgments of lots of crowd members, um, you can do as well or better than experts. We wanted to know if this was true in the context of misinformation identification. So we did this as a collaboration with Facebook, who was developing a sort of crowdsourcing a product, and they asked us to you know, help advise them on what to do. And we were like, great, we really want to see how well this actually works. So they gave us a set of um, URLs that their internal algorithms had flagged as things that were in need of fact checks, either because they had some reason to believe that they were inaccurate or just because they were going viral or about important topics. Then we hired three professional fact checkers to do detailed research on each article and rate its accuracy. And we also hired uh, 1,100 unskilled Americans from the online labor market, Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, to just read the headline and lead uh, and say how accurate they thought uh, the article was. And so we want to know how well does the fact checker research and the crowd ratings uh, agree with each other. And so what I'm going to show you here is the correlation between the layperson headline ratings and the fact checker research ratings. They rated them on these one to seven Likert scales of how accurate and trustworthy and so on the, each article was. Um, and we're going to show you this agreement between the layperson and the fact checkers as a function of the size of the crowd. So how many layperson ratings we use per headline. I um, mean, we also varied whether or not we told them uh, the URL that it came from or not to see if that helped or hurt. 
And as our baseline, we take the correlation between the fact checkers themselves, because although there is a lot of agreement, um, the fact checkers are far from unanimous. So among the three fact checkers that we uh, recruited, the average correlation was 0.6. You know, which is much higher than you see in any kind of social science research usually, but it's far from one. And we wouldn't expect the crowd to do too much better than that. And so what we find is with as few as 15 or 20 layperson ratings, just reading the headline and lead, uh, that kind of gut rating correlates as well with the fact checkers as the fact checkers correlate with each other. And so this suggests that uh, crowdsourcing could actually be a useful way to identify misinformation um, at scale. And uh, we wanted to know, uh, so this is evidence from the US, and that's great. But then we also wanted to know, is this you know, specific to the US, or does it generalize more broadly? And so we can use the data from the accuracy condition of our big cross-cultural study that I told you about at the beginning of the talk to look at this question. What we do is for each of the 45 headlines, um, we you know, sample some random number of layperson ratings. We calculate the accuracy uh, rating for each headline. And then we see how well we can classify the true versus false headlines based on those ratings. So here I'm going to show you the AUC uh, for predicting whether the headline is true or not based on the crowd ratings um, as a function of the size of the crowd and uh, the country. And what you can see is that. Uh, Basically everywhere, or almost everywhere, with 20 lay people per rating you're get, per headline, you're getting an AUC of over 0.9. And even for the couple of places where it's a bit worse, it's still doing uh, AUC greater than 0.85, which I think is better than most of the models uh, that are out there. Um, so I think that this suggests that the power of crowds is also uh, quite general. Um, and this is also something we've been working with tech companies on. Like I said, we advised Facebook in their um, development of this community review product that they're using for identifying uh, misinformation. Um, and also Twitter has started doing this using something called Birdwatch, where um, they just sort of, people that sign up for the Birdwatch, uh, uh, whatever, to be bird watchers, can flag things that they see in feed as potentially misleading and then write notes about why they think it's problematic. Um, and uh, so it's exciting to see this starting to get uh, taken up. And we're, we're analyzing this stuff, too. Uh, the the Birdwatch, um, we had a paper in Kai uh, this year where we um, looked at who was doing, who was flagging what on Birdwatch. Because um, you know, an interesting feature of uh, that kind of crowd approach is people get to choose what to rate. We're not, you know, they're not getting shown things and saying, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? But they're going out and picking things to uh, evaluate and flag. And what I'm showing you here is each red dot is an article that a bird watcher flagged as misleading. And each blue dot is one that they flagged as not misleading. You can see about 90, over 90% 90 of the flags are people flagging things as misleading. Um, and then this is the partisanship, the estimated partisanship of the note writer and the estimated partisanship of the tweeter. And what you see is essentially all of the action is on the off diagonals. So it's like liberals flag tweets by conservatives as misleading and conservatives flag uh, tweets by liberals as misleading, <laughs> which we saw, we were like, oh geez, that doesn't look good. Um, but then we actually hired fact checkers to fact check the tweets, and it turns out that people are doing a pretty good job. Like there was over 80% of the tweets that the bird watchers said were false, at least one of the or misleading. At least one of the bird watchers, uh, one of the fact checkers, also thought was misleading. And so what's going on here is it's sort of like the two sides are policing each other. People are flagging counterpartisan tweets, but they're not just flagging all counterpartisan tweets. They're specifically flagging tweets that are counterpartisan and false. So we think that the system actually looks like uh, it's, it's working quite well. So just to summarize, um, the, like, the, our big cross-cultural study found, I think, striking cross-cultural regularities in both the psychology of misinformation in terms of who is susceptible to it and also the effectiveness of interventions. And we found evidence that uh, cognitive factors, social factors, and ideological factors are all important predictors of who believes false claims about COVID. Um, we found that, in general, sharing is less discerning than accuracy judgments. So there's this fundamental problem of trying to get people to be more careful in what they share. 
And we found that interventions developed in the US tend to generalize pretty well, getting people to pay attention to accuracy and providing digital literacy tips, increased the quality of uh, information people intended to share, and crowdsourcing was able to identify low quality information. And both of these things, or all of these things, offer scalable approaches that don't rely on a centralized authority deciding what to censor and what not to censor. So uh, that is a sort of uh, high level summary of what we've been doing for the last five or six years. Uh, and the one thing that I want to flag as I think an important future direction for us and for everybody that's thinking about misinformation is in 2016, uh, you know, when everyone started talking about fake news, it was these kind of like viral uh, posts by like random outlets you've never heard of that then sort of took off and really got amplified. Whereas I think a lot of the misinformation now, both around COVID and election fraud in the US and many other kinds of things around the world, aren't coming from you know, viral things. They're coming from political elites in sort of top-down coordinated misinformation campaigns. And so a big question for us is how different is the psychology and the effectiveness of interventions for misinformation when it's coming from elites versus bubbling up in this viral fashion? So thanks so much. Uh, please drop me a line if you're interested in any of this and uh, love to do some Q&A.